everyone. Welcome to End of Mission, the podcast where my throat hurts. And we talk about space missions that have ended. I'm Paul, the pressure-fed astronaut. Who are you? Oh, I'm Face of Sarcasm. I'm the idiot who thought this would be a good idea. Yeah. I was going to try to sound like Fred Ziffel from Green Acres. I think you need about 70 more years uh, before you can really pull that off. Yeah, and the and the three people who understood this joke, you're all very old. Isn't it past your bedtimes? Oh, it's I, way past our bedtimes. I say, posting this Monday at 8 a.m. Okay. I sure hope you do get some sleep before then. Oh. Do not. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to talk about four spacecraft and three missions. With two guys on one podcast? Yes. Perfect. Comet. Contour. And two CubeSats. Oh, I'll look at them. They're so adorable. You know what I realized? What? We're going in order of success for these. And you'll oh, see this. Oh, as in like they're, they're getting more successful or less yeah, successful? more successful. More, okay. Yeah. So we'll just get right into it. All right. Okay, so... You, face of sarcasm, want to do a microgravity experiment for your small business, which isn't a drug empire in New Mexico. Okay. The problem is, to grow some of this crystal, you need to do it in microgravity. Now, okay. in 1991, you have two options. Option right. one is a sounding rocket. So that's a small, solid rocket like you see here, this guy. Okay. And you'll, you'll launch... You're going to space, you got three minutes of microgravity. It's decent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can, you can do that. You can launch on time when you want to. Downside, it's only three minutes of zero-G flight. Yeah. And, it needs a little longer for the crystal. Yeah. And your launch environment might be a bit harsh. Because well, the you're Mexican on, desert? Because you're, no, because you're on a sounding rocket that's all solid. As you can see, this is three stages of that. This is a okay. black brand. It's one of the most popular sounding rockets made. So the alternative you have is something called a shuttle getaway special. So see this can right here? Yeah, the trash can looking thing right there. That is a getaway special. For 10... What's a getaway special? That's what I'm going to tell you. For $10,000, you could put your microgravity on the space shuttle. You can get up to 16 days of microgravity on the, for the spatial low, low price of ten thousand dollars compared to about a million dollars for your sounding rocket yeah oh geez yeah no i'm going for the, the for the shuttle yeah the trash can okay so when i say ten thousand dollars that does not include the fact that you have to validate this so it can fit in the space shuttle <laughs> okay so the problem here is your experiment can't be more than 200 pounds okay it's got to fit inside the can okay it's got to have its own power supply Okay. It can't explode. Okay. And it's got to have minimal astronaut use. What does that mean? So, at best, the astronauts don't even know it's there. At worst, the astronauts flick a switch once a day. Oh, so for, like very passive. Yes. System. Now, for a lot more, you could do a hitchhiker, which they will interact with that. They'll say nice things to it, blow kisses or whatever, but that costs more. Uh, so the real problem, of course, is when I say microgravity, if an astronaut sneezes, it's not really microgravity anymore. Whenever they fire the thrusters, it's not technically microgravity because the shuttle's going to accelerate, right? You're firing the thruster, you're moving a little. That's acceleration. Oh. So you might get some imperfections in your crystal growth. Uh, and then shuttle scheduling, of course, is a bit of an issue because the shuttle loved getting delayed. Uh. Yeah. There has to be a better way. Yeah. Well, you look at that. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. That's the Commercial Experiment Transporter. Comet. This is a uh -oh. small satellite. As you saw, it's about four feet wide. Uh, where you have about 30 plus days in microgravity. You can launch on schedule. And you can even recover your experiments. Could I not recover the experiments beforehand? You could. These spend a long time in space. 
Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't have to go through like space shuttle daycare. Exactly. Okay. So Comet was proposed in about 1990 by Westinghouse Electric and Defense Systems Inc. to foster commercial microgravity research. So this this is okay. why I wanted to have a little draw tool, which I don't know, which I don't have now, uh, because oh. it's made of two basic parts. Up here is a recovery capsule. Okay. Down here is an orbital experiment module. So both can carry experiments, but the recovery okay. module brings them back to the surface. So if it's in the bottom half, it's staying up in orbit. But if it's in the top half, it can return. Yeah. So this right, this little pyramid thing right here, that's the nozzle of a Star 27 motor meant to deorbit this. And it would just come back down. And I think it could be reused. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, nice. Also, you can have exterior mounted science experiments right there. Okay. You know what's funny? I found a lot more on Comet than I thought I would. Yeah. Like this. This is the uh, this is the paper on the cooling system for it. That's why they keep talking about like base plate, cold plates, and you know the stringer attachments, the CPL uh -huh. condenser loop. That's how I found this diagram. Nice. It's good. It's a good diagram. It is. I never thought I'd find this. <laughs> so you can carry about 150 pounds of payload for 30 days in the recovery module. So that'll come down after 30 days. But okay. if you want to put it in the on-orbit module, you can do 100-plus days in orbit. Will and, it eventually come back down? Well, yeah, orbital decay. It's only put in a 300-kilometer by 300-kilometer orbit, so it will come back down eventually, within okay. about five years, I'd say. Okay. So, because I don't think it has onboard propulsion. So it's just going to fall out of the sky, yeah, basically. Good for, yeah, good for it. Yeah, good job. Now, the rocket that's going to carry it is one that should be familiar to subscribers. Conestoga. Oh, nice. Yep, Conestoga was just bought by EER Systems in 1991 when they bought Space Services Incorporated and got Deke Slayton involved. And the plan was to launch in early 1994. Okay. So, NASA sponsors the project through the University of Tennessee Center for Space Transportation and Applied Research, CSTAR. Uh, NASA is kind of by congressional mandate supposed to help foster commercial space development. Uh, actually, the launch of Conestoga 1 in 1982 cre helped create the Commercial Space Act of 1984 so we could build a regulatory framework for private rockets. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Figure out like all the legal issues with yeah. putting private stuff into space. Because it's, yeah, privately owned missiles is probably the other way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you suing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so Westinghouse would build the systems engineering and the service module, so this part, which I'm the circling. Yeah, it's got four solar panels. It's really neat. Space Industries, Inc. would do payload integration, recovery systems services, so when this thing comes down, they'll go pick it up and give it a smooch. Uh, okay. Do, I spelled orbital wrong. Orbital? I had to publish this three times because of spelling mistakes, and I still have one. <laughs> <laughs> so orbital operations including building an operations center in league city texas and then eer systems would provide the launch vehicle and services okay yep now nasa gives money and funding to support three comet missions with the option to do two more depending on success or however things go so if it goes great they can do five missions yeah and how many do you want to do right it's a commercial spacecraft they can do what they want. Let's see what they can do. Yeah. Comet 1 would launch in early 1994. Comet 2 would follow up in November 1994. And then Comets 3, 4, and 5 would be September 1995, 1996, and 1997. Okay. You following me? Yep, following you. Cool. Basically a year apart, aside from 94. Yeah. So on board Comet 1 were about 14 experiments. Now, I found data on three of them. Just three? What about the other 11? Good question. Oh, is it like we're not supposed to know what's on the other 11? No, I just can't find anything. Oh, okay. Uh, you search in Comet Payload. It does not give you anything related to this. It thinks you want to talk about Contour or Rosetta or anything else but this. Okay. So it's a bad naming convention. Yeah, they should have named it something like 
Veronique, like this old French rocket stages. Well, that makes that makes things so easy to research. It's such a name of journalists that write about these things. I'm not salty about that, by the way. So the first one up that I found that that was actually really interesting is the Space Automation and Robotics Center Auto- Autonomous Rendezvous and Docking System. So that's a mouthful. It is. But the plan was to take Comet 1 and Comet 2 and dock them to each other. Oh, okay. And so right here, it's pictured, the top picture. So that's the docking port, and that's the docking probe. So this would be on the first Comet mission. This would be on the second one, uh, below the recovery modules. Okay. And so the idea was, this is pretty much a precursor to what's going to be happening in the near future with satellite servicing, which is they wanted to dock these and then transfer fluid, like propellants. So you could resupply the spacecraft so you don't have to keep launching them. Just refuel them and they'll be happy. Okay. Right? Uh, There's plans to do this on the space shuttle, I think. I found some concept art. It was really weird. I found this the paper that I'm linking in the description that has all of this has more Conestoga concept art and another Noya rocket because why not? But it's really interesting to find what they were talking about, like space industries, like using this on Space Station Freedom as well to service spacecraft. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the other thing that I know was on there was a laser ranging system developed by Rockwell. Laser ranging system? Yeah, use a laser to see how far away uh, they are. Okay. Yeah, so Comet 1 would be the passive docking target after the recovery module separated, and then it have a halogen light on it so the other spacecraft could see it. When they're oh, coming into nice. dock, which means they do have propulsion systems on them, because if they're not even dock, there's not much detail on this spacecraft, might I add. Got it. Yeah, I mean, only three missions are available. Yeah, and then so docking would take place in late 1995, based on the schedule. Uh, this sounds a lot like the Orbital Express mission that did happen in 2007, where a spacecraft was launched on a Minotaur One which I also found the uh, documentation for the early version of that design in this same paper. Uh, oh, where, yeah. So it's got everything. It's got everything. And, yeah, so there was one spacecraft that was launched, and then another one was launched. It rendezvoused, and they docked, and they actually did about 16 different fluid transfer experiments. Oh. To see how you do it. How do you refuel spacecraft on orbit? What, what did they come up with? I don't know. I'll have to read up oh. on that. When we talk about it in five years, you'll know. Okay. Yeah. I gotta move. I, sorry about the mouse. It's just gonna be here. I'm sorry. This, but this You're is really filling into the professor role. I am. It's, where is the most inconvenient place I can put it? I mean, right in the center. I'm gonna put on some Over words. words. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna put yeah. on some words. So next up is Scarlet One. Solar Concentrator Array with Refractive Linear Element Technology. It's a, new de- means... it's a new design for solar arrays. So right now, well, okay, not right now. At the time, solar panels are like the ones you get commercially, where it's just a solar panel. Okay. The problem is, if you want to go into deep space, like away from Earth, there's this thing called the inverse square law. Do you know what that is? Yeah, basically, the further away you get, the uh, the less energy you have. So if you move twice as far away, you get a quarter of the energy. Yeah. So the idea was to pretty much build magnifying glasses over them. So that's what the concentrators are. So the light oh. will be focused onto a solar cell. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Scarlet 1 specifically, and I think this is it. This is it in testing because there's no spacecraft right around it. Uh this was to test the mechanical side of the arrays. You know, can they fold out? What do they do in space? They did a lot of good work with these on the ground, thankfully. Because, mm-hmm. uh, again, it's you want to do deep space missions with solar panels, you got to make sure these work. You want to use these. I do think yeah. com- commercial geostationary satellites use something like these. I know Boeing, the 702 bus, had them. And oh. I think there was a short-circuit problem on one of them. Short-circuited? Yeah. But I don't think they had to do with the solar panels. Okay. I hope not. I just bought one. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna put it on my house right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so NASA and others were interested due to the low cost and higher performance nature of the design for future missions. Okay, that's what I wrote. So it did perform excellently in ground tests before integration on Comet, because if you know anything about Conestoga, you know where we're going. Oh. Yeah. Scarlet <laughs> 2, the one that's pictured here, 
below was installed and flown on Deep Space One. Okay. Which we will be talking about this year, I think. Okay. Which is, I think, one of our first deep space ion-powered spacecraft, which means you'd need uh, big solar panels to power it. Yeah, and need them that, that concentration system to, to power it, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then this one, the next one I have a lot of data on, is the Bioserve PMAS, Plant <clears throat> Module for Autonomous Space Support. Now, I, in my research on BioServe, it turns out they pretty much do any microgravity biological research. So we'll probably see them show up on shuttle missions in the future. They have stuff on the okay. ISS right now, I think. Uh, so they're basically the ones that do all of this. Yeah, they do a lot of it. This okay. specific experiment that I found stuff on was specific to see how plants would grow in microgravity for something called cells. Controlled Ecological Life Support Systems. So here's the thing. If you want to go on deep space missions, you got to carry a lot of food with you. Right. For the people. Yeah. Well, the robots don't eat much. Right. The thing is, I read this. If your mission is longer than 147 days, growing food on board would actually save weight. Oh, okay. 147 days. That's the magic number? Somewhere around there, yeah. Okay. Which is like a Mars mission, let's say. Mm. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> so the thing is, you want to know how plants grow in microgravity because it's a completely different environment to Earth. And we've been doing this forever. We've been doing this since the 60s, just to grow plants right. in space, see what they do. So right. uh, where was I? Yeah, so this is, I know one of these was in the uh, recovery module. I think, of, I think the 14 experiments, most of them were uh, bioserve experiments because okay. if you look at say this is the experiment here right but what's that <laughs> i don't know what that is <laughs> that might be another it looks like one. a computer it it's we'll see a picture of a computer at the time okay <laughs> oh okay. that's another yeah so you can see here so it's going to manage carbon dioxide in the plant growth chamber so that's right here down here i'm right. circling it it's got it's got a video camera so take pictures you can actually transmit images uh five times a day to oh. league city texas it have a lamp of uh, a mix of halogen and quartz lamps. And I think they were to grow alfalfa in this soil up here. Okay. And of course, they have to use fans to blow air around because it's a microgravity. It'd concentrate and clump together. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. why. Yeah, if you ever want to be an astronaut, just know that you have to you have to learn to sleep with a fan. Because if <laughs> easy you... for me, I've already been doing that. Exactly. Because if you don't, you'll suffocate. Oh. Yeah, the CO2 will uh, cluster around your mouth. Oh. And you'll breathe it in and die. That's uh, that's terrifying. Or a good murder mystery plot. Mm, yeah. I don't really get the detective up to the space station to solve it, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Maybe you'll be invited by an eccentric billionaire. That's how that will... Yeah, it'll be Elon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Does it send TV images? That's the video camera. This is in the recovery system. And then, oh, right. the guy here, uh, just get you a scale of the experiment. His name is Dr. Steve Simpsky. That's Simpsky. him. Simpsky. Yep. Okay. That's a pretty small box. So this is the one that's actually in the recovery module, I think. Okay. I don't know. But again, look, right? That doesn't look like it. That doesn't look like it. <laughs> that doesn't yeah, those look are like, like it. shiny black boxes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't Does know. Does it have like a blue covering over it? It could have been added later though. That's the thing. True. I don't know. It's hard to find data on these experiments, okay? Okay. So the other one I know exists is this guy that looks like a printer. That That's a it, weird looking printer. Yeah, it's the University of Alabama Huntsville oh. Nonlinear Optics Experiment. That's what I think NLO stands for. I couldn't find anything on it. This is the only image that I know of it that exists. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. I have no idea how many other experiments were on. If I found all of them or not, I don't know. Now, the Comet program proceeds very slowly and rather poorly. Now, as reports will indicate, the project is structured properly, how you would run a program like this. Uh-huh. 
The problem is that Sea Star sucked at it. <laughs> E.E.R. kept redesigning Conestoga, which would naturally impact the nature of Comet, since it's a Comet-exclusive uh, launch vehicle. Uh, E.E.R. complained to Westinghouse that they had an inadequate flight computer and forced them to change it. Is a big, big problem. It was actually so bad that NASA pulled out of it in 1994. Oh, jeez. But I think Dan Golden, the administrator at the time, said, wait, it's a commercial thing. No, we gotta, we got to get funding for this. So there was pretty much a negotiation involved that said, okay, fine, NASA will fund one mission, which is three times as expensive as it was supposed to be, and then EER would get control of it, and it'd be renamed Meteor to Microgravity Experiment Transporter Orbit and Recovery, or something like that. Jeez. Yeah. There was like so was was the pl- optimist, uh, So the optimism of like five missions went down to one. One. Well... E.R. said, oh, yeah, we got a commercial science experiment thing. Heck, yeah. We're going to get so many commercial flights out of this. Ooh. There's a reason we're talking about it. (laughs) Yeah. So there's two quotes from the contractor report, which I've also linked in the description because I always cite my sources that talk Mm -hmm. about this. Uh, The first one is, while each person performed admirably, there was an incipient flaw in the basic assumption of Comet. The contractors had to desire Comet success enough that they would put their energies into accomplishing the program within its defined cost and schedule, or fund the variances themselves. Pretty much, they wanted to actually build this thing and not just get money from NASA. Oh. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. The second one, from an unknown congressional staffer, is... It sounds like it has a massive cost overrun. There is no commercial market, and NASA doesn't need it. I don't think anyone's going to try it and save it. Oh. So, Meteor 1 gets a launch date for late 1995. The first launch date is August 4th, 1995, but upper-level winds, so that's high-altitude winds, cancel the launch. Okay. It's then pushed to August 12th, 1995, your negative second birthday. Thank you. Thank and you for at, doxing me. Yes. And at T minus one minute and 36 seconds, two of the Castor 4 motors suffered a massive electrical failure. <laughs> and oh, at no. some point, it got, so it got pushed to October. And I think in October, the DOT uh, did not approve the launch license because they said, oh, no, the recovery module is not going to be sent to Utah now. You have to land it in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Virginia. Oh. Which delayed it, because you had to file the paperwork. This was three days before the launch, by the way. Oh, man, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. So, on October 23rd, 1995, Conestoga 1620 and Comet 1, okay, Meteor 1, lift off. But there's a problem. Right. I found the report that describes what the flaw was. Oh, yeah? What was it? When you're doing a design and analysis of a rocket, you're going to do what's called vibrational modes. You have to figure out how this thing wiggles, right? Right. And you, to do this, you have to build what's called a finite element model. Okay, what's that? So pretty much, it's kind of like how in Blender you have a mesh, uh-huh. right? Well, it's like that, but instead of it, you build a mesh of, you know, Conestoga, and you apply your structural equations to it, right? How does it deform? How does it react to, you know, me punching it or shaking it or wiggling it? Right. Right. And the reason you use finite element analysis is, like, on a beam, the equations for that's really simple. You don't really need to do FEA on it. But if it's got, like, a hole in it or it's bent funny, FEA kind of works. Okay. The FEA model was not fine enough or not good enough. There is a torsional, so a twisting moment, that vibrated at 6.2 hertz, somewhere down here on the uh, engine mount ring. Okay. Okay. And the guidance system freaks out at four hertz. There was an there's a noise reaction there that was not caught. Ooh, four and six hertz are really close to each other. So basically, it like confused it. It freaked out. It had a yeah. I don't. Rem- I'm not a guidance person because I'm normal. But pretty much, it, it thought that there was something wrong with the vehicle. So what happens is it started overcorrecting and trying to correct the trajectory when it didn't need to. Oh. Yeah. Oh, also, just before we keep going, 
uh, this is the vehicle undergoing testing. See, those are old computers. 1995. Oh. Yeah. So, God. So that's the central motor, I think. There is okay. yeah, so there's the star forty eight, there's the payload fairing. Sorry. Okay, so getting back to this. Mm-hmm. So the steering mechanisms on a caster four are a blow down hydraulic system that does push pull. So, so pretty what, much, how does that work? So pretty much you have high pressure helium with like a hydraulic fluid. So when you want to steer, it just opens the valve so it pushes so it'll push the nozzle or pull the nozzle. Okay. And it's blow down, so every time you do it, you're losing chamber not chamber, tank pressure. So you have a certain uh, amount of... It's basically, yeah. it's the same system. Yeah, but you're losing pressure as you go. So you only have a limited number of times you can use it. Oh, okay. Now, on this motor, motor number six, it's overcorrecting, right? It's oversteering. And it's been doing this... It's doing it right now in this picture. It runs oh. out of hydraulic fluid at T plus 46 seconds into flight. Uh-oh. Which means it loses control. Oh, no. And at T plus 47 seconds, the flight termination system activates, and it blows up Conestoga, and blows up Comet, and they go straight into the Atlantic. Oh, God. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> now, EER said, don't worry, we have another launch coming up. And they never got the money for it. <laughs> <laughs> and they pulled out of the launch at business. Yeah, so they got out of the so launch. They, so they just ruined their one chance. <laughs> Yeah, I actually wrote a report on this for my systems engineering class. That's why I know so much. That's the reason I wanted to do this episode. It's because I just know a lot about Conestoga now. (laughs) And the real problem with this was it was hard to get customers on Comet or just customers for Conestoga because they kept changing their first launch date. They kept just pushing it back? Yeah. Here's the thing, though. They had the motors for the first launch by the end of 1993. Okay. They could have launched in early 1994 with a dummy payload. It would have blown up because mm-hmm. they didn't have the, the finite element model, but they would have found it and fixed it. Before putting an actual real yeah. payload in. Because think of it this way. If I'm a potential satellite customer and I see this happen, what I see here is EER cannot run a program. EER is overconfident and they make simple mistakes. Not worth my time. Yeah. I'm going to go on Pegasus. Or Taurus, which would have gotten all the same payloads. Jeez. Yeah. So lesson Oof. learned. What's what do we learn with this one? Uh, make sure you're not running a, your simulations on those ancient computers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just look at that. Oh. You can see how tiny Conestoga is. Cause that's the payload fairing. Yeah, it's pretty small. It's tiny. Because the Caster 4 motors are 40 inches across. Yeah, that's small. Yeah. So it's like, what, a meter? A little more than a meter, yeah. Yeah. On to the next one. Also (laughs) Comet-related. Comet Nucleus Tour, called Contour. Contour was part of NASA's Discovery Class Faster, better, cheaper programs. Okay. The goal here was to take a spacecraft and fly by comet nuclei from about 100 kilometers away to get some up-close and personal pictures with comets. Okay. Because, okay, not because, but the last time anyone did anything with comets that seriously was in 1986 with the return of Halley's Comet. Europe launched the Guiado spacecraft, which did a flyby of the comets. There was the French-Soviet Vega 1 and 2, which flew by Halley's Comet. There were the Japanese uh, twins. They were called Sagakaki and Suisei. I don't speak Japanese, and I don't remember their names. And then the United States sort of did one with the ISEE-3 spacecraft. We were going to do some comet observations from the space shuttle... But the experiments were on board Challenger. They did not see uh, Halley's yeah, comet. You can't exactly, uh, yeah, you can't exactly look at a comet from the, uh, yeah, from the bottom of the Atlantic. Uh. Yeah. So the idea was, okay, we have these Discovery class missions, which we're going to discuss a lot of those coming up. They're just small, cheap, inexpensive. Get on with it, get it over with, go to your mission. There were okay. seven goals for okay. Contour. 
One, get 25 times better resolution images of comet nuclei than the Guiado probe. So we're talking about four meters per pixel. Okay. That's how so good a resolution. Each, every single pixel is four meters. Yeah. It's good resolution images. Mm -hmm. Two, determine nucleus size, shape, rotation, albedo, color, color, oh God, color, Com heterogeneity, heterogeneity, and activity. So pretty much take up close pictures of a comet nucleus and see what, it's, what the heck's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Three, map the composition of nuclei surface and the coma, so that's the the tail, like the stuff coming off, through spectroscopy. Yeah. So, right, take pictures of what's coming out and see what it's made of. Right, And right. spectroscopy is how you do that. Right, because looking at the spectral lines and all that. Yeah. Fun crap. Yeah. Four, obtain detailed compositional measurements of gas and dust in the near-nucleus environment in precisions comparable to those of Giotto or better, just, you know, show off to the Europeans. Pretty much, again, it's characterized what's coming off a comet nucleus. Because we don't know. Right. We don't know. Just didn't know? Yeah. Well, I mean, we sort of know, but we're going to get up close. Right. We're going to, like, we're going to taste it. Yeah. It's, yeah, we're going to get up there and take a sniff. Uh, so, five, assess level of outgassing through imaging, spectroscopy, gas, and dust measurements. Right? What's coming out? Where is it coming out? Right. right. So basically just take a bunch of detailed like measurements and images of comets. Yeah. Six, assess diversity of comets. Uh, that is NASA going woke back in 2002. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Because they're going to fly by three different comets. Okay. And then seven, if possible, investigate a new comet. So... And I hope I, I wish I had my drawing tool, the ability to do that, because this image here doesn't really capture what's going on. But this mission design is unique. What it would do is it would put itself into a uh, an Earth orbit. So it's an orbit kind of like Earth's. And it would use uh -huh. flybys of Earth to adjust the orbit so it would fly by a comet as it was coming into the solar system. Or the oh, inner solar wow. system. Because right, comets have really elliptical orbits. Right. So if you want to do a rendezvous of a comet like Rosetta did, you're going to do a lot of maneuvering and you got to wait a long time to get around that comet because you got to match the orbit so you can rendezvous and put yourself in orbit. But this was just going to do flybys. So instead, it put itself in an orbit that would fly really close to it as it pummeled into the solar system. Right. So instead of matching the orbit, it just goes flyby like, yeah, ah, pictures. Yeah, pretty much. So the first one, it would do a flyby of Comet Enka, on November 12th, 2003, this is going to launch in 2002, just to kind of give you a uh, timeline. Okay. The second comet it would fly by is Schwarzman Wachmann 3 on June 16, uh, 2006, and then okay. Comet D-Arrest on August 16th, 2008. So a good six-year mission with the option of going yeah. to another one. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, and the guy the guy on this doing orbital mechanics is Bob Farquhar or Farquhar, however you pronounce his last name. I'll learn that for ISEE three. That guy is an orbital mechanics wizard. Really? We will see more of yeah, when we do ISEE three, we'll talk about him a lot. Cause that guy was just okay. really good with the stuff. Got it. So this is the spacecraft. Is that Futura? Uh uh, probably. It's, it might yeah. be Futura, yeah. Uh, yeah we'll talk future. about the yeah. We'll talk about the specific experiments on the next slides, but I think we just got a good overview of the spacecraft, what's on board. So this thing mm -hmm. only weighs like two thousand pounds. Yeah, it's only a ton. Yeah, it's lightweight. So okay, so it's right two meters tall, two meters wide, so six feet. This is a Star Thirty solid motor for maneuvering. So here's one of the four experiments. That's engines. That's the compact uh, comet impact dust analyzer. That is the contour forward imager. Okay, just for clear, forward, this is the top, this is the bottom. Right, yeah, put the engine on the bottom. Yeah. Uh, What's some... car called a forward imager if it's going the wrong way? Nerds. Oh. They're called nerds. I don't know. But, yeah, but nerds would say things logically. Well, well the thing but... is, so when they do the flyby of the comet, this is the part that's going to be facing the comet. Oh, they're pointing the engine towards the comet. Okay. Yeah, because they've already used it at that point. This is a big dust shield right here. It's about a foot thick. Oh, so it's going to like protect the uh, the equipment yeah. and everything. Yeah, it's got okay. thruster pods. It's yeah. flying through. Okay. Yeah, and then the communication stuff's up top over here. You can't see it. Right. So here are the four experiments. So 
right okay. up here, this is the contour for an imager. So this will aid in navigation, and it takes images of the comet nucleus for gas and dust jets. There are filters. So see these little circles here, the pink guys? Yeah, the little carousel of circles. Yeah, yeah those are the filters. Okay. So these, yeah, so these will, fil these will filter for the wavelengths of major species of ionized gases. So like uh, hydroxides, cy uh, CNs, and I think ethyls. I, I'm not a chemist, as you can tell. Right. Right. So and, it's basically it's specialized lenses to look at the different colors of meth. Yeah, pretty much what's coming out. Got it. Looking for that specifically so it doesn't get get confused. And so these are right. mirrors, actually. So this is the imaging element right here, but these are mirrors. Mm -hmm. And what they do is after the flyby, they just rotate it to the next one because the other one would get pulverized by dust. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So this guy that looks like he's squatting going, come at me, bro. That is yeah. the Contour Remote Imager slash Spectrograph, CRISP. This one will provide high-resolution color images and infrared spectral maps of the comet. So it also has a 10-position filter kind of like on uh, CFI for, okay, this is the visible spectrum, I think. 450 to 770 nanometers. I think that's the visual spectrum. Yeah, that's yeah, that's about the visible spectrum. Yeah, and then it have 256 wavelengths in infrared from 800 to 200, uh, 2,500 nanometers. Right, but okay. It's taking pictures of the thing. Yeah. Now this guy here, the, I don't know, saxophone, the instrument. I don't Telescope know, look at the thing. Yeah, that guy. That is the Contour Impact Dust Analyzer, CETA, or KIDA. I don't know. So it's an upgraded version of what was on Guiado and Vega. It's a mass spectrometer that would catch dust and then using an electrostatic grid, ionize it and then throw it down. I think so they capture it here and then throw it down here and it measure the time it take for the, the nuclei, the, the parts to come to the bottom and hit. And that's how it does spectroscopy. Oh. Yeah, I think. I am not a scientist. You want to talk about engines? <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Science? <laughs> yeah. And then this, which does not look good, this looks like an AI-generated image of, like, a Terminator. It's a very crusty image. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's got, like, five pixels. It's kind of scary looking, too. This is called the yeah. Neutral Gas and Ion Mass Spectrometer. So it measures the abundance and isotope ratios for many neutral and ion species in the coma. So we're talking, like, water methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and other complex molecules that are on the comet that are being outgassed. Okay. Yeah. Visually just monitoring those, like yeah. measuring those. Scarily, of course. I mean, look at this thing. Whew. So yeah. here's some other interesting spacecraft details because I need to fill this thing in. It's got <laughs> one Star 30 SRM. It has 16 hydrazine thrusters for maneuvering. The dust shield is 10 inches thick. And oh. to save money, this thing would go to sleep between encounters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because uh, the Deep Space Network costs about $2,400 an hour to use. Oh, that's, that's expensive. Yeah. So you want this thing to be asleep. And we'd use this on all of our spacecraft now. Okay. New Horizons went to sleep. Our Mars rovers go to sleep. The engineers so go to sleep. Was this the first one to incorporate hibernation? I don't think so. Okay. Because I think some of the earlier Mars probes did, too. Got it. Like the Mars Climate Orbiter. Right. That one went to sleep pretty quickly, too. Yeah. Okay. So, Contour launches at 2.47 in the morning, Eastern Time, on July 3rd, 2002. Oh, right before Independence Day. Yeah. And the launch vehicle is a Delta II with four, I think these are Castor 4s as well, or these are Gem 40s, to get this, so you can get the scale of Conestoga, how tiny that thing is. Oh, yeah, wow, okay. And I think it's got a Star 27 upper stage on top of it. Now, it's put into an elliptical orbit around Earth that looks kind of like this guy, with a 225-kilometer okay. perigee and a 1.75-day period. Another part of this design for the mission was that it won't launch on a direct trajectory to where it wants to go to do the first flyby. Instead, it's put into a phasing orbit so that you can give... So it doesn't have to have an instantaneous launch window. Right. 
Right. So it's going to wait 43 days in its phasing orbit before it fires up the star 30 on August 15th, 2002. Okay. Now, the burn begins at 4.49 a.m. Eastern Time on August 15th. Okay. They're supposed to hear a signal that the burn worked 45-ish minutes later at 5.35 in the morning. Wait, so hold on. The key word to that was supposed to. Did they not? No, they did not. (laughs) Oh, no. Now, at roughly the same time as the burn, a defense monitoring satellite picks up a flash where a contour is supposed to be. Oh, no. And then from the 16th through the 21st, the observatory at Kitt Peak in Arizona notices three objects where contour is supposed to be. So you see these <laughs> green, little green circles? I see four of them, yeah. You know, there's, there's six. I don't think this image was formatted right. So, th- yeah. So there's three objects. But I think it's the way this thing works. It's technically six. But it's three large objects where contour is supposed to be. Oh. Uh. <laughs> so what happened? There's oh, no. <laughs> three solutions to what happened. One is that the heat plume from the star motor caused a structural failure. Okay. The second one is that the star motor just exploded. The third solution is that space debris hit it, and then it exploded. (laughs) The report, which I've also linked in the description because I cite all my sources, talks about these solutions, and... Well, the real answer here is most likely the first one, and I want to introduce you to a concept called qualification by similarity. Now, have you heard me talk about that before? Um, wait, so qualification by, by similarity. Basically, okay, what does that mean? Well, let's say you want to mount a new body panel on your car, right? That drunk guy who hit yours didn't damage it as much. You want to replace the panel. Right, didn't total it, just yeah. damaged that. Like the fender. It's kind of close to the old one so you don't want to do a full structural analysis when you mount it on your car because you don't want to fall off right yeah now you don't want to spend too much time doing that structural analysis you say okay this is going to be qualified by similarity because it's kind of similar to the thing right the old your new panel is basically the same as the old one right same material same contours same shapes same fastener locations same loads right basically the same piece the report suggests that apl the people who built this did not do that properly. Uh-oh. Now, I can't find specifics, but what it suggests is, because it's all proprietary, is that right. the people building the spacecraft didn't thought, oh, well, people have put solid motors inside geostationary spacecraft before, so we can do it. That's not a problem. Okay. So the problem is, this is different than what they do in geostationary spacecraft. It's not similar. Right, so it's like you want to put your panel on your car, and now you've put a big hole in it somewhere. That's different, because uh, shear loads will change if you put a big hole in your panel instead of just putting the panel back on. It's not similar anymore. So, wait, how is it not similar anymore? So, if you're, like, think of body panel like your hood, like the hood of your car, right? Right. If it's similar, it's basically the same thing. Okay. But yeah. now let's say you drill a big hole in it, like a foot wide. Uh huh. It's not similar anymore because there's a big hole in it. Right. Okay. So now you have to do some analysis to prove that by putting your new hood on, it's not going to fall off or explode or something when you drive your car down the road. Okay. I don't think the hood is a good example. I because... know. Well, I'd, I'd talk about what I work on, but that I can't. <laughs> But it's um, what would be what would be like so where were they drilling the big hole into contour? In this case, they're they're putting the nozzle pretty close. They didn't do proper. Uh, that's item four. The ATK analytical models were not specific to contour. So ATK now Northrop Grumman built the motor, and I guess from what it sounds like, their analysis they did for this was not capable of simulating contour properly, or they were not even doing contour. And the way the program was set up, there was no one there to say, hey, uh, this doesn't actually work. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so, pro- so in another 
failure of simulation. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, so we're, so let's see. Okay. So one, the big one: lack of telemetry during critical events. They didn't have. They weren't talking to Contour when the engine turned on. We don't do that anymore. Oh. <laughs> wait, so when, we, wait, do we now talk to all the rockets when the engine's on? Yeah. It's a mission critical okay. event, right? It's your ejection burn. Or at yeah. least to the best of our ability, right? Like when we do like our Mars rovers, it's 20 minutes delay, obviously, but we're monitoring it. Versus, right. well, talking. in a day we'll see if it made it. That's up. We'll go out for some pizza. Second, significant reliance on subcontractors without adequate oversight, insight, and review. Again, it's someone should have noticed, hey, this doesn't actually, might not work. Uh, so there was, like, just no communication yeah. between the and, people who needed to be talking to each other. And to toot my own horn, pretty much, because, again, what I do at my job is I review stuff like this. Obviously, it's not this specifically because it's not space-related, but it's someone wants to do, you know, you want to put a panel on the thing I work on, and it's similar. Yeah, but you drilled holes in it. <laughs> it's two pieces <laughs> instead of one, and you change the fasteners, <laughs> Right. That's not the same right. anymore. The internal loads are going to be different. The shear is going to be different. Like One of them was like, yeah, you did your analysis for the shear on the bolts by not including reaction forces when you should have. You know, that kind of stuff. Okay. I hope this is vague enough that I don't get shot. It is vague enough. You have no idea. Yeah. I mean, it's so vague. At this point, I, okay, let's, let's pretend it's like a, a kitchen like cabinet door. Okay. Okay, so, you got, so let's say you have a cabinet door with two hinges three screws on each end, right? One attaches to the cat, three attached to the cabinet, three attached to the, the door, and it's got a curved handle, right? You know what I'm talking about? And it's made yep. of oak wood, and it's got that, you know how they always, ha like the ones that we have back in uh, our hometown, you know, back home, they always have like yep. the, the paneling around them, right? Yeah, yeah, um, like the framing. Yeah, so a similar one would also have the same hinges, be made of the same wood, maybe the the hinge that you, like the, the handle you use might be a bit different, because you know, no one makes them anymore because our house was built, what, 1988? Now it's, you know, the modern era, right? That doesn't matter as much. But it's still got the same two hinges in the same spot with the three screws. Same screws, same wood. You're fine. But yeah. now let's say it's one hinge, two screws, and it's made of plastic. That's not similar. Yeah. And that's a really extreme case of it. Yeah. But it's different enough that you'd have to do your own stru separate structural analysis. Yeah, is that hinge going to support the door? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Viewers makes sense. listening, I hope this made sense. Number five. Oh, no, number three was inadequate communication. Again, someone should have stopped this. <laughs> so you needed me. Uh, at, let me see, in 2002, I would have been six. Seven. Oh, yeah, six, six or seven, yeah. Even August, so six. <laughs> six, right, yeah. The analytical models were not specific to contour. Again, it's got to be the thing you're doing. <laughs> it, yeah, again, going back to the kitchen cabinet and out, you know, uh, thing. Right, but no, no, you did, your model was for bathroom cabinets, guys. That's completely different. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay, different enough. Yeah. Five, limited understanding of SRM plume heating environments, which I spelled wrong, in space. I really got to learn how to spell <laughs> Maybe you just should type this up in Word document. I should it does probably have do that. I should probably. That's do how that. I do it for all of my slides. Yeah. So pretty much they didn't under again. Everything here points to the fact that they just didn't do this right. It was faster and cheaper, not necessarily better. <laughs> and then significantly course, worse, one might say. Yeah. And then six lack of under of orbital debris conjunction plan. Pretty much they didn't check. Is this thing gonna hit anything when we turn on the motor? Which again, it's, I don't think that's the right answer. I think it, it's, I think it was the complicated one where the plume heating caused a structural failure because this thing's made of uh, carbon composites structurally. Okay. And those would like delaminate and fall apart. I guess. I guess it overheated because I guess so. What I guess happened is that the plume climbed up in here because even even though it's still the space environment, it's gonna go everywhere. I guess right. it probably just heated this all up more than it should have, and then it just fell apart. Ah, uh, thermodynamics. Pretty icky. important. It, ew, the icky stuff, yeah. Exactly. And then seven, limited understanding of the contour SRM operating conditions. Again, 
they didn't really simulate this properly from what it sounds like. They said, ah, it'll work, I guess. <laughs> Jeez. So there was a proposal for a Contour 2. Oh, yeah? Never happened. Can't imagine why. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there are any other... There, there were NASA Comet missions. I think Stardust... Yeah, that's the last Comet mission NASA did, which launched about the same time as this one. Oh, okay. Ha- have there been other Comet missions? Well, there's Rosetta. I think Deep Impact or Deep Space One visited a comet. Okay. And people in the comments will will tell us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they'll be all over it. They're currently yeah. looking at Wikipedia right now. Yeah. Because we're going to talk about one of them in the near future. Okay. No spoilers. Yeah. All right. So now, now we're into Artemis 1. Ooh. Yes. Recent. Most recent of these. The most recent end of mission we'll ever do. <laughs> the hardest part about making this slide was finding a good image of Artemis 1. There are so many of them. They're all really cool. I picked this one. Okay. So Artemis 1 as we all know, was a debut of a full SLS Orion stack. This Mm -hmm. guy. Yep, full thing. Do I really need to explain much more about what Artemis 1 was? (laughs) It's, yeah, okay. But here's the thing. SLS can toss a lot to the moon more than Orion. So what NASA said was, hey, we've got payload space on the Orion stage adapter, so this guy, or right there. So that's the ICPS, that's the second stage, that's the Orion panels. Between them, that right there is the Orion stage adapter. Right, okay, kind of like a smaller cone thing, right? Okay. And inside, there was payload space for 13 CubeSats. So NASA offered, through their different programs for getting science experiments, 13 (laughs) spots to put you know, CubeSats, to launch to the moon. Oh. Yeah. Now, originally, there would be 13, but three of them pulled out due to scheduling conflicts. One of them actually launched on Falcon 9 on the Japanese lunar lander that failed, and I think that mission just ended, like, this week, because uh, I think they had a communications or propulsion problem. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's going to be a future episode. No. Well, yeah, but like 20 years from now at the rate we're yeah. going. Now, there were some issues with these that people brought up, which was they were, their batteries died because SLS got delayed, as we all remember. Oh. Again, remember, wait, so they, so wait, wait, they just put them in there and then they just have to sit and wait until they launch? Yes. Oh. So they were sitting in there for a, a good six months. <laughs> Because you gotta remember, yeah. remember the first rollout, and then they had to roll back. Yeah, and they rolled out again, and they roll back. So, how how expensive are those those cube sets? Uh, I probably I'd say less than ten million dollars each. But less than ten million. Okay. But they're solar powered, so they right. it, it's not like it's just annoying. You just gotta hope that they get oh, okay. solar power when they thrown out of the spacecraft that they had turned back Launches on. Launches at night. Yeah. Yeah. That was a problem. They launched at night. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you got... Oh, also, you can see them here, right? So this is the video of the uh, Orion separating. I took a screenshot of it, and you can see there's the CubeSats. Yeah, there they are. Well, okay, a few of them. I think it's these. I think yeah, that's right. Ones. Again, I need... I want to figure out how to do the draw tool on this. Yeah. So I can draw pictures. I so, see your mouse. It works. Yeah, people will look at this and get mad at me. So where, am I, where should I put the mouse now? So the first one is called Argo Moon. I have no idea which one's which on the, the picture, by the way. I don't know. Got it. That's, that's classified. So first one's Argo Moon, which took pictures of Orion and the ICPS. I've seen some of them. They're pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Two is BioSentinel, which grew yeast in deep space. It's no relation to BioServe, I don't think. The okay. guy with Comet, I don't know. I don't think so. There's Equellus, which was a JAXA, that's the Japanese uh, 
Space Agency. They have a steam-powered spacecraft that's on its way to L2 right now. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's going back to steam power. Yeah, we got water. It's all over the solar system. Why not use it? Yeah. All right? Steampunk future. Exactly. Then you have Luna H map, which would look for water ice at the poles. Power that steam-powered uh, spacecraft. Exactly. Lunar ice cube, which also looked for lunar water ice. Really got a water-based future, don't we? Yeah. Water world. The Kevin Costner ah. movie. Perfect. Yeah. Then there's CUSP, which was a technology demonstrator for a space weather constellation that's going up eventually. Okay. Then there's Loon IR, which is a demonstrator for lunar remote sensing equipment. Okay, and this is basically just like seeing the, the distance to the moon? Or yeah, it's kind of just looking for stuff. Looking for geographic features, minerals, pretty much what okay. we do on Earth with our remote sensing spacecraft. And then there's Team Miles, which is a demonstration propulsion and communications CubeSat that might be dead. Team Miles said back in December that it wasn't, okay. and they haven't said anything since. Are they dead? I don't know. Okay. But we have two confirmed dead spacecraft, though. Oh, no. Omo Tanashi and NEA Scout. What do those do? Omo Tanashi is the outstanding moon exploration technologies demonstrated by Nano Semi Hard Impactor. Ah. Uh. Yes. It's a 14 kilogram 6U CubeSat. So that means that it's based. So a CubeSat's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Okay. So this is the equivalent of six of those, right? So that's 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters. Okay. So okay. it's it's the size of like a TV screen, a small TV or a laptop, in like rough dimensions, and then just thicker. It's about the size of a big tower computer. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like the one I'm recording on. Yeah. Yeah. So after separation from the ICPS, they'd fire some cold gas thrusters and put itself on a lunar impact trajectory. Oh, it's gonna so hit it's going moon. straight into the moon. Yes. Then, before impact... So at T, uh, T plus four or five days, a six kilogram solid motor and lander would separate from the spacecraft and perform a landing burn. Oh, whoa. Which is about 2.5 kilometers a uh, second. So you can see this conops here. Uh -huh. So this would put itself on a collision trajectory. It would separate. So this part would separate and it would just be this little guy here, a solid motor and a little airbag. Oh, okay. So basically just be, that would be the little lander, so that one survives. Yeah. So this airbag would deploy at about 100 meters, and it would hit the moon at about 30 meters per second. So it's like 100 miles an hour. It's like 100 hour. miles an hour. Yeah. And it's this little guy. You can see it. It's just this tiny little guy. Yeah, it looks like the size of a fortune cookie. Yeah. Uh, those are made in the United States, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I think that's fake Chinese stuff. This is Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a, a little history on that. They were originally made by, uh, well, I mean, fortune cookies were originally made by Japanese people, but then in World War II, they got put in the internment camps, and so oh. the Chinese, oh, the Chinese uh, took families it. took over. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. You learn something yeah. new every day. Yeah. I know I can't learn anything more, because I can do one thing a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what they'd have on board, so this person here, this little guy, I keep saying little guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with Little this, fella. Yeah, so this would be a transmitter to say, hey, I landed on the moon, and a radiation monitor for future human space exploration of the lunar surface. See how many lethal doses they're getting? Yeah, per day. Yeah, or per nice. week, per month. And the lander itself is a little over half a kilogram, so about less than a pound. Yeah, about a pound, yeah. Yeah. It's this tiny little guy. It's so cute. <laughs> Except... The spacecraft began tumbling after separation from the ICPS, and they couldn't really talk to it. Ooh. They're, so from what it sounds like, they, it was, the tumbling prevented them from talking to it properly. Or it didn't get a chance to charge. Right, because right? you can see where the solar panels are, right? So if it's tumbling yeah. too fast, it doesn't charge. There's, right, because it's not yeah. getting exposed to the sun enough. Yeah. There's actually a spacecraft that uh, like radio people listen to. It pulses because it's spinning, and the batteries don't work, 
but it's got a solar panel and it spins at a rate where the solar panel solar panel charges a little bit and it transmits. <laughs> so you can actually listen to it as it tumbles. It's really interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. There were plans to attempt recommunicating with the spacecraft two months ago, but that didn't work. Okay. So it's dead. So it's just, it's dead. Yeah. Now, in the technical papers, which I have also linked on this, I thought it was kind of funny. They had a little message from the team lead on it, and it says, I am, oh no, I don't speak Japanese, so it's Tatsuaki Hashimoto, the project team leader. It is very difficult to attempt any challenge that no one has ever faced, but it is a very exciting project. I believe that such extreme technical development will help future space exploration. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's great. We don't have those in our technical papers for our spacecraft. No. No, not at all. Then again, you know, this one's dead. This one didn't so. work. Well, the other Japanese spacecraft worked. It's steam-powered and it's going to L2. Does that have a cool message on it? It might. I didn't look at that. Oh, okay. I specifically looked for the report on this guy because this one didn't work. Right. We're talking about yeah. this one, okay? Because it ended, yeah. Yeah. Then there is NEA Scout. This is the one I was really interested in. This would be a 6U cube set. It's, this is the diagram of it here. Mm-hmm. With an 85 square meter, so it's like a 190 square foot solar sail that would deploy and fly by the 18 meter diameter asteroid 2020 GE. Oh, whoa. It's a, yeah, it'd be this a small spacecraft that would fly by a really small asteroid. It's really cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what would happen on the mission plan is it'd do one to three lunar flybys, and then to adjust its trajectory, kind of like uh, Contour would do by doing Earth flybys. Right. And then right. it would take a two to two and a half year cruise to a near-Earth asteroid using the solar sail. So it'd spiral oh, up wow. to go rendezvous. So the, so the asteroid, it would perform a 10 meter per second flyby which would be the slowest one ever done. To put into perspective, Contour was going to fly by Comet Nuclei at 20 kilometers a second. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and it was designed specifically to get favorable lighting conditions when it took pictures of these, uh, this asteroid. Ah, uh, so the camera yeah. people, the photographers, they got a say in this? Yeah. And what it would do is characterize the small body for use in future planetary defense concepts. Because the more most likely object to hit Earth in the near future is not some big, you know, planet killer. It's a little mm-hmm. boulder guy. So if we know what those are like, we can defend Earth better. Yeah. And makes sense. And if it survived, it would fly by twenty twenty GE again or go to another target. Makes sense. Except after it deployed from SLS, the spacecraft failed to communicate with the ground. Now, there were attempts to do this, to contact it, but by December 22, there was no contact, and the solar sail had obviously failed to deploy, because if it had deployed, ground-based telescopes would have seen it. So basically, you just look up and you just like, yeah, oh, there, yeah, it is. there it is. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> Don't know what happened, but yeah, it... It just died. That sucks. And so this is this is what it's made of. There's pretty much no science experiments on it except the camera. You got a star tracker. So so for navigation, they use star trackers. They tell yeah. So pretty much it's telling it. Okay, the star is here. Look at that. That's how you know right, where you are. That just like yeah. orients the the craft. It's kind of like old sailors. Yeah. Right. Uh, you got that thing. The, the EPS, of course. The, the interface get board, a- of course. Get just a bunch of letters. Yeah. Uh, got the radio LNA and the SSPA, as you would, of course. That's that's how this works. Yeah, the LNA and the SSPA provided by JPL. Yeah, duh. For oh. the NEA Scout. Okay, this one, GSE connector and separation switches. That's the part that talks to the ground that's connected to the SLS. That's I know that. Uh, ah. I think that's the data transmitter. That's the low-gain antenna. So you got sun sensors. So these detect where the sun is. Sun sensors, of course. Uh, they right. got reaction wheels uh, for when it, you to know, yep. rotate yeah. the spacecraft. Also, for when it starts its YouTube channel. Yep. And they got solar panel restraints. So it's these guys because it's got to hold on to the solar sail. Right. Uh, and it's got the AMT, of course. 
Duh. Mm -hmm. And you got the solar panels down there. You got solar panels. Yeah. You know, these sail deployer there. There's actually pictures of the sail being, like, unfurled and tested. It's really cool. cool. Yeah, it's just... I think it's, like, two millimeters thick. That's... That's honestly kind of... Two millimeters? Yeah. It's pretty thick. Yeah, but... It's thin and lightweight. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many solar sail spacecraft there have been, actually. Um, Wait, how many? Five. Okay. The first one blew up. I think the second one also blew up. (laughs) Are we going to have episodes about those? (laughs) I think so. I think they're in the pipelines. Not anytime soon, but... Right. <laughs> Probably the yeah, solar sail failures. I'll put that. That'll be the, yeah. the next kind of collection of failures. Because I know the Japanese built one that flew by Venus. Oh, cool. Yeah. That one, I think, worked. So we're not going to talk about it anytime soon. <laughs> and then there was Light Sail 2, built by the Planetary Society. Because Light Sail, Light Sail 1 was the first one that blew up. It was launched in one of these old Soviet missiles that was turned into a satellite launcher. Yeah, that has reliability written all over it. Yeah, it took off and exploded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that that's... So what did we learn from, from Artemis 1 CubeSats? Uh, maybe put extra juice in the batteries. Yeah. Well, the problem is they don't want the spacecraft to run off launch vehicle power because think of, think of there's a short circuit... Yeah. You don't want these things to drain the batteries of SLS, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a design flaw right there. Yeah. I mean, you want to have, so yeah, you want to put a little extra juice in the, uh, you want to put a little extra juice in the batteries because it might be sitting on the pad for six months. Yeah. Uh, you want to have good communication between all the stakeholders involved when you are manufa- when you're making a, uh, a spacecraft, you know, like a, a space probe. Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're conducting any sort of like stress simulations or stress tests, you're actually doing it for the right vehicle. Yep. You know, the one you're actually putting into space, not well, like a close approximation, the actual one. <laughs> yeah. The most important lesson here is a week extra of analysis saves you a lot of time than blowing it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so these are these are failed missions. Comet, Contour, and some CubeSats. On the next episode, what do you think we're going to talk about? Um, well, judging by the images that I see on screen, it looks to me like we're going to be talking about some kind of a successful and intricate and well-detailed uh, shuttle mission called Challenger. STS-7, specifically. It's notable because there is a lady on it. Oh! <gasps> Really? Yep, Sally Ride. Ah. And this is a picture of the mission. And look, if you look closely, you can see some getaway specials. Look. There, oh, yeah. there, there, there. And there was one image I was going to use for, instead of the one I did, of like 12 getaway specials on STS-64. Oh. I'll, pu- I'll pull it up. This one. Oh, whoa. Yeah, so you can see... Yeah, oh, so the experiment that was going to look at uh, Halley's Comet was a Spartan, one of these guys. Mm-hmm. And so these are getaway specials, all of them. Oh, my God. Yeah. And another one over there. They're just Yeah, so every time you see one of these little canisters, just know that's a getaway special or a hitchhiker. I One, of the, one or two of these might be hitchhikers. So in the next episode, we are going to discuss STS-7, the famous mission with Sally Ride. Oh, okay, so... Since this is still a test episode, for the descriptions of the spacecraft and space probes, was that enough to understand what's going on? Is it too little? It can't be too much, because I want to talk about what's on these missions. So, was this enough to kind of cover what's going on? Do the explanations work? I got to figure out how to make, uh, so I can draw pictures, little smiley faces on things. Because this is what the next episodes will be like. When we talk about space shuttle missions, there's actual details on these getaway specials, so we're going to talk about them. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, I'm a complete idiot when it comes to like space travel. 
to me, it, it made a lot of sense. It made sense to me, but, you know. Except maybe the qualification by similarity argument, but that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I rambled enough, someone would have picked it up. And you have Google. Yeah. Gosh. Well, I mean, I mean, the concepts, I think we eventually got it yeah. down with the, uh, the kitchen cabinet. Yeah. Hey, look, that's making the seven. Look. Yeah, a little seven with the, can- the cannon arm, yeah. Yeah. Just like in the mission patch. Yeah. That's cool. All right, folks. This, this was... has been. Oh, you want to? You want to? Fine. You do the outro. It's your idea. This has been. End of mission. <laughs>